Hello everyone, this is Steve Marinucci, Beatles Examiner on Examiner.com, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, our weekly uninhibited roundtable discussion of the Beatles past, present, and we hope to come. Let me uh, first introduce uh, my four fearless co-hosts uh, out in the Pennsylvania area. We have the executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine, Mr. Al Sussman. Good evening, Al. Hey, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And halfway up the New England coast, uh, we have the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And up in Maine, uh, even though he doesn't want to admit it, he's in Red Sox country, um, our musicologist and Beatle author, Mr. Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. Go Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't resist doing that stuff, especially especially as a Red Sox fan. Although the Red Sox started out really badly, so you should be happy there. Right. So, well, I think the Yankees right. may be doing even worse, but yeah, they, yeah, both teams, even and the Giants, are not doing very well either at this moment. But anyway, <laughs> it's early. Today we're going to we're going to kind of shuffle through a couple of topics. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about, obviously, are the three. Uh, musicians we we've lost in the past week as of the day we're doing this which is the 25th the big one obviously is prince that shocked the living daylights out of everybody and there was also uh, guitarist lonnie mack and today or last night actually so today or last night uh billy paul who did me and mrs jones let's start with prince uh, i'm gonna let me start the discussion because i was online when the first notes uh when people started passing around tmz links and i have to admit i i I, I posted something at the time and i said if this is a punk this is the biggest punk of all time because i was really crossing my fingers hoping that they'd been completely fooled and sadly that's not the case but i was uh, i mean it's like michael jackson and of course at this stage where we are now we don't know the results of the autopsy although we've been hearing some things about uh about drugs although the i know several stories that i'd heard after the day after he died saying he never took anything so i don't know but you know but it's really it, it's just so sad that to lose a talent like that and there's no question you know i mean none of us are going to argue that this man was not talented he was and and i watched that rock and roll hall of fame video uh and and read the rolling stone story which blew my mind because olivia almost didn't let him play that freaked me out i could not believe that she would actually because the reason was because he didn't know george but she let but she was persuaded to let him in and god he gave the performance of his life i mean that was just astounding Go ahead, Did Dad. you get the impression that, that maybe Danny argued on his behalf? Because if you look at the, mm. the clip, which is out on YouTube, the interaction just in terms of eye contact between Danny and Prince is, is actually mm. pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think, I think Danny – the Rolling Stone story, did you read that? It didn't say – I don't think that Danny argued it, – it, but it said she was persuaded, and I, and he he did have a comment, I guess, after it was over. Uh, uh, but you could see him smiling all the way through it. He was just yeah. he was he was extremely happy. And there's no yeah, I have no no doubt that he was one of the reasons that uh, she got uh, persuaded to allow that. But boy, that was just that was amazing, absolutely amazing. She probably uh, wanted it to be more like the concert for George, where. Everybody on stage were really friends of George, mm-hmm. and that would have meant more to him, and, and she probably wanted that approach. That's what I'm guessing here. Yeah. And since there's no real connection between Prince and George, you know, with the Beatles for the most part, you know, I can understand her feeling that way. Yeah. It's kind of mm-hmm. like what we've talked about before when, it, when we've discussed tribute concerts here. There are shows like the concert for George, which is emotionally draining not just because the the performances are so wonderful but they're all people who meant something to george whereas um you you take something like george fest which is great in its own way which just came out recently but a lot of those artists are new artists of today that george didn't even know Mm -hmm. so i could understand olivia's uh, approach or, or what she was thinking at the time but yeah you watch that performance and i remember back then when we first saw it 
we were all blown away and mm-hmm. everybody was talking about prince yeah you know mm-hmm. but um it was nice to have tom petty uh sing the song mm-hmm. while my guitar gently weaves along with jeff lynn and i had forgotten that steve winwood was on on the uh performance mm-hmm. too on keyboards mm-hmm. too and danny uh, it, it's interesting that um, you know of the the comments that have come from you know sort of the Beatle the Beatle camp, the, you know the tribute uh, statements to, to Prince. Uh, the one that seems to be the most heartfelt came from uh, from Sean Lennon, which makes mm-hmm. sense because Sean is you know part of the you know the generation that really was turned on by Prince, and right. plus the fact that. Uh, you know, apparently they were they were friends, and at least according to Sean, uh, it was Prince who got him to stop smoking, which is quite a thing when you consider that his father smoked chain smoked right up to the night of his death, and uh, and Yoko was also a smoker. I don't know whether she's ever given it up or not, but uh, but the fact that that Sean was able to uh, to give it up at at the urging of Prince is. Uh, is really something and uh, his his comments were very very heartfelt so mm. you know it's um uh and and danny's as well mm-hmm. yeah you i know. i was uh i was that was that was surprising yeah i uh it was it was uh it was interesting anybody else want to say anything there uh i mean that well, was as, as we've been saying throughout this entire year it's been a brutal year really for oh, yeah. all the musicians that have died but, you know, in, in a way, this is similar with David Bowie, where we didn't know yes. what was going on. Yeah. And um, I'm really feeling for, well, everyone who, who was affected by these musicians of the past year, but in particular, Sean, because Sean had a relationship with Bowie, too, mm-hmm. you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and loved his music. So, in fact, he was there at um, the first Bowie tribute in New York City. He performed mm-hmm. um, on stage. So between Bowie and now Prince, Sean's really got to be feeling it. Sure. So, I was uh, I was quite, I was quite surprised because when I looked up uh, when I went looking up, you know, Twitter comments that night and saw Sean's series, I was like, oh my god, really? Mm-hmm. I was yeah. I, that was amazing. Um, Julian's didn't pop up until the next day, which was which. Um, and so, but um, yeah, I mean that was just. That was just wild. It really was. But you know, but it's it's think- nice. It's nice that Paul and Ringo issued statements because yeah. you know mm-hmm. Prince is not someone that I associate with with Paul or Ringo for the mm-hmm. most part. Even though I'm sure their paths crossed. Yeah. So I I was pleased that they said something. But there is one other connection, which is the fact that Sheila E was in Ringo's All Star. Yeah. Band right. Very three true. Tours. And on all three tours, there were two songs that Sheila performed. Uh, the Glamorous Life, and also A Love Bazaar, which Prince uh, wrote uh, both mm-hmm. those songs. So, right. go drummed on a couple of Prince compositions there with Sheila E. Mm-hmm. Right, right, That's yeah, true. yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't even, I didn't even think about Sheila. E. Um, so, I'm, I, I'm looking up here. I'm sure she. Oh, here's what she said. Uh, when death comes too early, chaos reigns in its wake. During times like these, we must rise above the dusk. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. See, so. And they, it does seem it, it does seem that the, you know, the 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 musical luminaries that we've lost in you know just the spate of uh, the span of what four months, are all, for the most part, are are ones who really kind of push the envelope. You know, Bowie. Prince, uh, Maurice White of Earth, Wind, and Fire, Keith oh, yeah. Emerson, even right. you know, even even Glenn Frey, who was a you know kind of a pioneer of country rock. I mean, you know, the 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 current country music owes a hell of a lot to the Eagles. Mm-hmm. Sure so do. yeah, so they and and, uh, and 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 you know, I hate to to sound morbid, but the year has just begun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's only yeah, and yeah, exactly, and you know, and most of, these, most of these people that have died are older, and it's gonna it's gonna happen, and I don't even want to think about it, and I'm sure a lot of people listening don't want to think about it, but I mean, the time will will come, and God help us when it does. Um, well, you know, you know it's uh, you know it's. <laughs> 
especially you know especially for performers they 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 do seem to reach you know their 60s and 70s and one thing or another happens yeah know? i didn't uh, i didn't i didn't think he was that old i when they said 58 i was surprised i I didn't think he was that. He never looked that old. Right. He never acted. He never acted that old. Let's put it that mm-hmm. way. So, um, let's talk a little bit about um, Lonnie Mac um, and Billy Paul, um, both of whom also died, and for very, you know, for for fewer people, obviously, they had uh, some, you know, influence and some, you know, they they uh, their music meant uh, something to them. Uh, I have somewhere in my collection the uh the vinyl uh Lonnie Mac album from the fifties that uh and he was a great guitarist. I, I think I I played uh his uh, version of Memphis which he recorded at a session for somebody else uh, and they released it after and it's it's a great cover of the Chuck Berry song. Um, sure. It was but, a hit uh, it was a hit really I think it was during the summer of sixty three. So it was that you know, that last summer before uh before Beatlemania hit America. Mm-hmm. And uh and it's interesting that it's a cover of a song that, that the Beatles themselves covered uh mm-hmm. for the B- for the BBC. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was and he was a he was a technician on that on that V uh on on that V neck guitar, you know. He loved that. Yeah. So but uh and then Billy Paul I um I have to say my I I I, I mean I, I I've everybody's heard me and Mrs. Jones I mean you couldn't help but hear it it was a big hit mm-hmm. but um I didn't know can you reveal something really interesting uh, there um oh I was going to say Lonnie Mac covered from me to you by the way mm-hmm. and can can you reveal something interesting as we were talking before the show would you like yeah. to tell everyone <laughs> well Billy covered let him in and um, it was released as a single. And in fact, it was not long after the Wing single. It was either really? in 76 or 77 it came out as a single. Mm. It was a minor hit here in the States. And I think I it was it. Uh, like it. a top 40 single over in the UK. But um, it was kind of similar to what Paul had done. Only um, there were some African Americans mentioned in, in the lyrics. So um, he took some liberties there. So, yeah. And it kind of reminded me in a way... I'm always a little bit surprised whenever someone covers a Beatles song or a solo song right after the artist already recorded it. And it reminded me of like when Wilson Pickett uh, covered Hey Jude. And oh, it was sure. a single like almost instantly after the Beatles uh-huh. version was. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I, I always liked that version. I used to play Let Him In from Billy Paul back in my days on New Jersey Radio. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's one that he covered right there. You can always check it out on online. Hmm. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure some people will check it out. Let's go now to our next little topic, which will be Paul's tour, which keeps chugging on and chugging on and adding new dates. He just added a second date in in uh, Cleveland today. I, I've I've been watching some of the McCartney mailing list. I don't know if you guys get are on those you know fan Uh mailing lists but there is some real concern about his voice and how he's going to hold up on this tour um you guys want to say something about that um what do you well well as a matter of fact um in i just got today the the new beetle fan extra i don't know alan do you still get the uh, the fax version version i know the the mailed version just Oh, yeah, you get the mail version also. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I got it today. And in there, there's a there's a review from uh, Beatle fans' longtime West Coast correspondent, Peter Palmieri, of the, the same show that uh, that Steve saw and reviewed last oh. week. And was, Peter, Peter was there, and I didn't see him. Darn. Yeah. And uh, uh, what's what's interesting is he he mentioned something that you kind of touched on a little bit last week, and mm-hmm. that is uh, uh, to quote Peter, he says that in his performance persona and uh, and charm, it makes makes you overlook the vocal deficiencies, and mm-hmm. in that in that way, he he compares it to uh, Elvis in the seventies. And to Sinatra 
in the I guess in the eighties and early nineties mm-hmm. when you know when it was you know very obvious that they were you know not what they what they had been physically or even uh, maybe even mentally. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd go that far. Especially well, no, I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that. I mean, uh, you know, just the fact that uh, that people at the concerts, except for you know, because usually when you when you see the comments about his voice, it usually comes from people that never go to the shows. And um, the people that actually go to the shows, they don't, you know, they don't really seem to be all that concerned uh, yeah, okay. about, you know, about his voice. But, you know, obviously it's not, uh, you know, when we'll be talking a little bit more about this uh, in the next the next segment. But, you know, is, you know, his voice is not what it was. Right. You know, and that's, you mm-hmm. know, that's all that's all there is to it. And, yeah, and, and you know, mm-hmm. I, I uh, I've been wondering, I keep wondering if they will, you know, record this or will they, if they will put out some kind of a live anthology or of some, you know, of the recent tours, kind of like what Ringo did, you know, at one point. Um, you know, I mean, I, 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 it's like I said last week. Um, you know, you you you're there. You, it's the. Uh, I mean that segment that Paul does where he says drink it in I think mm-hmm. that the, the reverse is true yeah <laughs> the reverse is really yeah, true very, very, very much you know? so and, yeah. and, and, and uh, you know it's, it, it's hard for me to say that without sounding like a you know like I'm I'm falling apart you know screaming and stuff but I mean it, you know I mean you have to you, you gotta give the guy you know credit for you know what he's what he what he is what he does you know I mean he doesn't uh you know, uh, make people run away from from the you know, the stage because they hate. You know, they don't want to see what he's doing. Or, mm-hmm. you know, he's very enjoyable. That's his. He, and he has charm. That's one damn thing that's always that he's always had. You know, that we can't sure. Get you know, yeah. another thing I, I think from the reports that we're seeing. I'm mean, obviously I haven't seen him this tour, but uh, you know, we're we're talking about you know an occasional minute or note here and there and and you know and the same thing with you know saturday night live when he did maybe i'm amazed i mean yeah that was unfortunate mm-hmm. that it was the only song he did and and so that sort of makes it loom larger but if the guy can play like a two and a half hour set and you only mm-hmm. have a couple of things to complain about at his age you know it could be worse yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, mm. and I think, uh, you know, and yeah, I was kind of saying that last week too. I mean, the guys in his seventies. I mean, Jesus, you know. I mean, if I, I mean, if if I was to sit here and sing right now, you guys would probably all be all covering your ears, you know. I mean, you don't uh, want very to, likely. You don't, very. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to do that, you know. But I mean, I mean, I mean, this is a okay. But this is a guy that you know we know has a great voice. I mean, one of the best rock and roll voices. And I'm not trying to, you know, be overly, you know, overly. Uh, uh, I, I was I sound like a, a, you know, a huge fan, or I mean, you know, you know, whatever. Uh, but I, I mean, we know he has a great voice. He's got one of the best rock and roll voices. I mean, I, I'm not the only one that's ever said that. So I mean, yeah, I mean, when when guys get older they you know i mean sinatra wasn't wasn't perfect at the end i've heard uh tom jones actually it's a little sounds a little rusty when i've heard him recently oh, and, absolutely you know, so it, it it happens it happens i mean it and but like like you say alan i mean if that's all you have to deal with in in a three-hour show that's fine you know it really is i'm gonna hold off making any kind of criticism about Paul's voice until I see his show. But for the most part, I just wish that there are certain songs like Maybe I'm Amazed that really and truly he can't cut it anymore. I mean, that one is is a very difficult song to sing, and I mm-hmm. wish that he would take it out of his set list, albeit it is a classic. Everybody wants to hear him do it. But, um, you know, for the most part, when I've seen him do a two-and-a-half-plus-hour show, yeah, he's had a few moments there when he's when he's missed a note. But and I also don't necessarily buy this thing that as you get older, that you can't expect to be the exact same way. Yeah, that's true. But there are people who really uh, work their voice 
and know exactly what to do and what they're capable of doing. I Tony mean, you Bennett. take a look at Tony Bennett. Perfect. Right there, Al. Thank you. I mean, the guy is, what, 90 years old? And oh, for, uh, near, nearly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Close to 90. It's, 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 I think he's 86 or 87 now. Really? All right. Yeah. Forgive me. He's 80. But still, yeah, he's so amazing. He's amazing for yeah. his age. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen people like uh, Little Anthony, who's sure. got to be... I don't know, upper 60s or yeah. at this point no. or something like that? Is he? No, he's, he's well in his 70s. Okay. Thank you for correcting me several times. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind. But he's amazing. I mean, they know how to work their voice. They know what they're capable of. They don't overdo. There's something to be said about that. I don't know if Ring Paul up. actually does vocal exercises. I know he sure does the, the sound checks before his shows. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing because it warms them up and gets them ready. But, you know, there wouldn't, it wouldn't be a crime if he cuts back on his shows and does a two-hour show. Or yeah. even, you know, God forbid, an hour and a half to two hours. Most performers that I've seen do a show that's two hours or less. Paul gives you a lot more for the money. So it's very hard to be super critical of someone like that. And for the most part, he does pace himself in a way where he does songs that might be vocally demanding next uh, vocally demanding first, then the next song is not as demanding. He knows what to do yeah. in that regard. So, um, but still, for someone who's seventy-three, right? Wait a minute. So about to be seventy-four. Oh, no, about to be seventy-four. Uh, what he pulls off is is pretty amazing. Yeah, but, could uh, I, I just make an observation? I mean, not to take yeah. anything at all away from Tony Bennett, who is incredible, but the kind of singing Tony Bennett does and the kind of atmosphere Tony Bennett sings in is different. I mean, Paul is yeah. on stage in a loudly amplified rock uh-huh. show and singing things like, you know, Helter Skelter and, you know, really sort of very shouty things. And those. Uh, mm-hmm. songs and that condition of you know having to sing in in that much noise you know it really does take a toll on your voice that singing in uh, a, a somewhat more restrained setting which tony bennett does um mm-hmm. you know doesn't doesn't do so um you know i mean yeah that and in, in a way you know maybe that's why he sort of settled back into some uh other kinds of projects now and then, you know, where he's, he's in an acoustic setting and, you know, not out there having to shout over the sound of a rock band. I mean, it, you know, it's quite loud. You've been in a band, you've played on stage, you know, that like to, to overcome that you, you end up pushing your voice a little more than maybe mm. natural to do. And uh, even though, he knows how to do it as well as anybody. Um, it still does take a toll, I think. And uh, mm-hmm. so I, I'm not sure that comparing him to Tony Bennett is, you know, it's it's true that Tony Bennett has you know gone on for quite a while in great voice. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, mm-hmm. and again, I, you know, it's not like Paul's voice is shot. You know, it's no. you can't make it's it all here and there. Well, I mean, so, you know. You know None of you guys a... mentioned. None of you guys mentioned Ringo. I mean, look at Ringo's a great example. I mean, Ringo's older than Paul, and he sound his voice sounds great. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, granted the shows aren't as long as Paul's are, right. but he's still and he's, and he and he's not on rest in between. Yes, like, exactly, yeah. and he and he That's doesn't true. do as many songs. Right, you know, his songs sing. his songs aren't vocally demanding the way Paul's are. Right, right. and he, exactly. and he also brings his songs down lower in key. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And mm. Paul rarely has done that. Right. So, yeah, you make a very good point, Alan. But then there's something to be said about songs, the way that, that Tony Bennett sings his songs, which require, you know, a, a very good vocal range there to be mm-hmm. able to hit high notes mm-hmm. and to stay on the notes. I mean, uh, there's someone like Colin Blunstone. Colin Blunstone is an amazing singer who's now uh, in his early 70s. Whenever I've seen the zombies in concert, his voice is absolutely amazing and he stays on high notes he has control you know you don't really hear paul sing high notes and stay on them for long Mm -hmm. so you know of course colin blundstone is not singing helter skelter like you said yeah but uh you know there's different types of vocals but i think uh for the most part we should be really happy that paul is able to do what he does and um i think if it wasn't for the fact that he's 
one of the greatest singers of all time, and we've come to expect the greatest vocals from him anyway. I mean, when I listen back to uh, or I watch Rock Show, <laughs> I mean, oh. my God, was he on top uh, of mm-hmm. his game right there? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Those are the vocals that we love to hear. So, um, but Ex- that's except that was 40 that, years ago. Yes, I was just about to say, yeah. Yeah. So, well, anyway, okay. Well, and that brings us to our next little um, topic. And uh, when Paul, uh, when Diana Krall showed up in Vancouver to sing My Valentine, or to play My Valentine with Paul, it made me, I went back to, you know, to look at uh, Kisses on the Bottom and, and, um, and I put the album on. And I thought, you know, this is interesting because I have to be honest, I haven't really listened to it much since, it, you know, since uh, uh, I stopped listening to it right after it came out. And I'm, I was wondering how you guys felt about the album. And I'm going to start, let me start, uh, well, Ken, I'm going to start with you. Um, how do you feel about Kisses on the Bottom now as opposed to when it came out? I love the album a lot. I love most of all the production behind it, the arrangements of the songs. Um, I love the fact that he's doing something like this. The only problem, I have a couple of problems with the album, which is I wish that Paul didn't do so many songs in his softer voice. I do like the softer approach, what he calls his littler voice. But I think there are too many times when he used it. And there's nothing wrong with certain songs to do that on. In fact, he's done that. And other times in his solo career. And even in the Beatles, I think when he when he sang I Will, for example, that's a very softer delivery in his vocals. So when I hear him do that kind of thing on Kisses on the Bottom, it takes me to songs a song like that. But at the same time, you know, I wish that uh because I still think that many of these songs he can do in his his ordinary range, his his vocal range, I wish he would have uh sang more songs that way. And in particular, if you listen to songs like Accentuate the Positive, where he's using his normal voice, mm-hmm. or My Valentine, or um, Only Our Hearts, which to me is like the gem on this album. Yeah. There, there yeah. are the two, you know, nobody ever talks about that song. Everybody talks about My Valentine. But Only Our Hearts is a great ballad. And Paul mm-hmm. is singing that in his regular range. And I'd like to have heard more songs sung in that range. And I wish that there were a few more up-tempo songs because the the album does drag a bit because it's very ballady. Mm-hmm. Um, but the arrangements of the songs are wonderful. And I found it really interesting in particular, um, a song like Bye Bye Blackbird, which you're so used to hearing up-tempo. And mm-hmm. Paul's doing this real slow version. And it works that way. You know, it's nice. On my radio show, I played Ringo's version and, and Paul's version back-to-back. And they're so completely different. And... Um, you know, I like the album for a lot of reasons, but mainly because the arrangements are wonderful. The songs that were chosen were interesting. They weren't just the songs that everybody knows. There were some of those and some more obscure tunes in there. And I love the fact that Paul embraced this stuff because he always did like that kind of music in the first place. And he really should have done this a long time ago. You know, we've talked about how Ringo did this on Sentimental Journey in 1970. And, um, you know, he was way ahead of his time, not trying to be. But uh, so many other artists went on to do that format, like Linda Ronstadt and Harry Nilsson and certainly Rod Stewart, and they were so much more successful at it. You know, I love the fact that he did this. I'd like to see him do more of it again. But like I said, I wish that he would sing more in his natural voice, because I still think that for these particular songs and others that he could choose, he could cut it. He could he could sing those songs in that kind of range. Yeah. All you got to do is hear those songs. Only Our Hearts. Listen to Only Our Hearts, folks. That is a great song with Stevie Wonder doing a, a really nice harmonica solo in there. You know, if, if uh, most of the songs were his natural voice and there were a few more up-tempo tunes, I would have liked the album more. But overall, it, it was, you know, it's an impeccable performance in, in terms of arrangements and production. Al? Well, I, you know, I went in with, you know, with a built-in bias toward this kind of material because this is this is the the music that i kind of grew up with before i really started listening to rock and roll mm-hmm. uh you know it, it was the you know the, as they call it the great american songbook 
And, you know, that was, you know, in, in you know, where I lived, we had uh, the old uh, WNEW in New York on as our, the constant radio station. Plus, also, these are the kind of songs, most of them are the, the kind of songs that, you know, you heard all the time on the on the variety shows of mm-hmm. the, the TV variety shows of the 50s and early 60s. So I've always loved this material. And I, and I had always kind of wished that Paul had done uh, an album like this. And frankly, he probably should have done it about maybe 10 years earlier. Because, yeah, uh, Ken mentioned the, the songs in which he uses his little voice. And it's, and it's true that on those songs... That's where the kind of ragged edges of his voice now is most is most evident. Uh, I, I noticed that listening to it uh, just the, this afternoon. As a matter of fact, uh, I like the the fact that he that he used a you know a small group that it wasn't. I I, I had a feeling that if he if this album had been produced by George Martin. Uh, he might have surrounded Paul with more of a, you know, more of an orchestral uh, landscape, mm. musical musical landscape, much in the way that uh, Nelson Riddle did with, with Linda Ronstadt, Gordon Jenkins did with Harry Nilsson, mm. um, and and Rod Stewart on had an, on all of those those standard albums that he did. So I was glad that Paul used. A small group headed up, as Steve mentioned, by uh, Diana Krall, and the and the material, as as Ken said, uh, a lot of these are songs that you know, not everybody's going to know. I mean, the Inchworm. The only people that would know the Inchworm are people that saw the movie Hans Christian Andersen. Mm. For the you know, for the most part, uh, actually, 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 Al, I remember, and I don't know if you guys do. Mm-hmm. Uh, Annette, Annette did the song uh, way back when. Um, really? Yeah, I remember. I remember a record with Annette. Ah, I mean, well. someone else, someone else that we know affiliated with Paul also did the song. Mary oh. Hopkin. Oh, you know, you're right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Who are you? Who are you uh, thinking of? Uh, Mary Hopkin. Oh, that's right. There we on go. On postcard. That's right. Which, yeah. Paul, which Paul produced. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. So it's but, a you know it's a it's a nice mixture of you know the standards like always and it's only a paper moon and the glory of love and accentuate the positive and things that are that are lesser that are less known plus the two the two originals my my valentine and and only our hearts which as ken said is just a is just a wonderful wonderful song Mm. so it's an album that uh, that i've i've always really enjoyed just with the caveat that maybe maybe he should have done it 10 years earlier when he you know when he was when the the (laughs) the the as as Ken said, the quiet voice had, didn't have quite the raggedy edges that it, that it does now. Can you pinpoint those raggedy edges, like a few songs where you heard it? Yeah, uh, specifically, I'm looking at the uh, home uh, when shadows mm-hmm. fall. Uh, definitely, mm-hmm. uh, uh, more. I cannot wish you. Uh, mm-hmm. Although although as Paul has said, that's a song that uh, that is very emotional for him. Right. So, so it's possible that the kind of, uh, you know, vulnerable vocal quality comes from his emotions rather than any vocal raggediness. But, um, yeah, that's probably, and even accentuate the positive. This is a little, a little bit of raggediness on the, but just on the edges. Again, it's nothing, okay. nothing major. But uh, but I just you know when I when I first listened to it when it first came out and then particularly today when I was listening to it I thought you know if he had done this maybe ten years before uh, this would have been you know a real a super album but that said it's still a very good one. But if you like his natural voice like on My Valentine and Only mm-hmm. Our Hearts, don't you think he could have done all the songs on this album that way? Uh yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think that's probably. Uh, yeah, I, I I I can't I can't argue with that. But yeah, you know, if- it's possible that he was you know again using the the small the small group setting. Maybe he felt that the you know the small voice as you call it uh, was um, uh, was more appropriate. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a good. I think that's a good, uh, uh, very good state, uh, Al. Uh, mm-hmm. Alan? Um, yeah, I think I'm going to surprise you guys, actually. Uh-oh, um, uh-oh. Yeah, yeah um, when this came out, I really strongly disliked it. And uh, the distance from there to loving it is a little bit too long for me to have traversed in the past few days. Um, I mean, I listened to the album again the other day for the first time since it came out, really, and, you know, listened to it when it came out and had no reason to go back. But listening to it again, I've got to say, I really kind of liked it. Not loved it, but I, I could I could see what he was doing. I mean, I think that, um, and, and I think we may all agree on this, that the small voice was a very deliberate choice, you know, and and, and mm-hmm. probably, yes, because of the small ensemble. The small ensemble was a deliberate choice. I think if he had done it with George Martin, he probably, you know, I, I don't think it would have been just a question of, you know, going into a room and it's what George Martin wants to give you. I think he discusses what mm-hmm. he wants, and, and George mm-hmm. Martin could, could well have done a, an album like this. I mean, the band is really, really good. I I. I I really liked listening to them, you know, very tight, good arrangements in, in, in really most cases and uh, and a, a really good sound. Diana Krall's piano, I mean, you know, who can argue with that? Um, uh-huh. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and there were others that stood out too. I mean, the bass playing, uh, Robert Hurst on at least a lot of them, I don't know, all of them, John Pizzarelli, guitar, you know, a lot of really good people in this group and uh and i kind of you know i i first when i listened to it again the vocal style bothered me a little but uh you know as i settled into it i began to think okay you know i mean he's doing it as if he's in you know the hotel carlisle and he's taking over the bobby short stuff you know right you know and and uh it just seemed to make sense to me, and uh, and and I kind of enjoyed it. Um, I, I haven't, generally speaking, enjoyed rock singers doing this stuff, with one early exception, which was Linda Ronstadt, mm. um, and that was then. This was not a repertory I really knew very much at the time. I mean, I, everybody knows some of these songs, but. It just wasn't something I, I listened to particularly. And I got her albums with Nelson Riddle, and I thought, wow, some of these, these are great songs, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. And, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and I said this to a jazz critic friend of mine who said, Alan, for God's sakes, get some Ella Fitzgerald records. And I got some <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald <laughs> records and never listened to the Linda Ronstadt records again. And then, you know, sort of devoured Ella Fitzgerald records and Sinatra records sure. and Tony Bennett records. And, you know, I mean, yeah. I just sort of, you know, how you sometimes like discover something, you know, for yourself, not like you're discovering it, but, you know, discover it for yourself. And then you just sort of say, okay, what have I been missing? And you throw yourself into it and you listen to 10,000 albums of, you know, whatever it is. Um, Mm -hmm. I did that. And, uh, and so, you know, Rod Stewart doing it, mm, didn't do it for me. Um, even Harry Nilsson, not much. Uh, really? I thought Harry, I thought Harry was good. It was okay. It was okay. But, you know, and I guess that was the way I felt about Paul's album as well when it came out. Plus the fact that, you know, what I want from Paul is new songs of his own, you know, whether I'm going to like them or not, or like most of them or not. I mean, I, I, I think of him as a songwriter. And so I didn't really want to hear him doing these things, you know, or I think of him a rock, as a rock songwriter. So if Run, Devil, Run comes out, at least I feel it's in his 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 area but i you know what ken says is true this was this was the music paul grew up hearing and um it, it's you know something maybe he should have done maybe should have done a long time ago but i don't know about that you know now that i've now that i sort of 
feel like I understand what he's doing with that voice in these songs. Um, possibly 10 years ago, he might have just sung them straightforward in his full voice. And I, mm-hmm. I think that yeah. these performances have a kind of, of character um, mm. that I found kind mm. of interesting. You know, I mean, I, I, I mixed feelings about it because I know what his voice can be. And these sounded in a way a little weak to me, but I felt deliberately weak. I mean, I just felt that this was a choice. This is what he's doing for a reason because, because he, he feels that, you know, this is the, this is a voice that can do these songs. You hear jazz yeah. singers taking that kind of approach, you know, sometimes. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, in a way, you know, having rethought the whole thing while listening to, you know, both the album and the live version, um, and I think in some cases I like the live versions better. I, I just uh, I, I just came out in a completely different side than I went in on. And I also like the extra things on the extended version. Like, I think Baby's Request totally belongs here. You know, this is, uh-huh. it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a perfect song for this kind of thing. And it, it shows that he can, you know, he can write in that style, which I guess we knew. But sure. hearing Baby's Request yep. in its original format, even though it's the same song, you know, didn't necess- I didn't necessarily think that, you know, this, the, the implications that this could be this kind of a, a, a jazz setting, and it's perfect for it. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I enjoyed it, actually. Hmm. Not quite love it hmm. yet, but <laughs> maybe, maybe if I hear it another couple of times, I'll get to where Ken is, but um, who knows? <laughs> Again, that's I, that's, I, that's, I that's never that's said it. that it was a perfect album. But, you know, I, I said what I liked about it and the few things that bothered me about it. Right. Mm. It, se- it seemed to me that he was trying to play kind of like a Bing Crosby crooner. Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of get the picture of him next to one of those big microphones, you know, um, with a with a small group behind him. And, and that's what he was really trying to do here. And uh, I kept really hoping and i think because i had hoped he'd do something like this um i remember writing something about this a couple of years ago you know a few years ago before this came out and hope and and uh i believe at the time he actually made some kind of a response at some point that he, you know but i mean uh, i uh, you know this is something i'd always wish he'd do and i always thought he would do it in kind of a till there was you voice and i th- and i think I think that's what we're all looking for. Uh, we were all looking for, and I think that when it, mm. that didn't that didn't happen, I think we were all kind of a little disappointed. I mean, I think every the surprise just didn't, you know, the 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 uh, the crooner voice trying to be Bing Crosby just didn't seem. It was so out of character for him. And I really wish if he was going to do that, I wouldn't have minded if he had done it on maybe one or two songs. But to do it for the whole album, it just didn't it, – it, it really didn't work as far as I was concerned. I mean, there are some songs I really like. I love I'm Going to Sit Right Down and Write Myself a Letter because mm-hmm. it's a great song. Because it's a great song. And he actually adapts that voice, the little voice, to that really well. Paper Moon is another song that I really, really like anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I can, you know, I can handle that. Accentuate the positive just sounds a little too croonish. And that's just, you know, uh, my Valentine is great. I mean, I, I'm not going to argue on that one. But, I mean, there are so many. It just seems like he was trying to play a role that he really shouldn't have played. That if he had been a little more natural, this would have worked out a lot better. Um, I mean, I love the band. Uh, Diana Krall is, um, let me say, I, I think I have just, I have all her albums. Um, I love Diana Krall a lot. Uh, I love her music. Um, I also like the fact that Paul did the Christmas song. I thought that was really nice. But I think uh, as a whole, my feeling about this has not changed that much. Although I will say after what Alan said, I'm going to go back and listen to it and give it another give it another uh, pass and see what it, how I feel about it. But it just the crooning thing just is the, what overshadows this for me. So well, you you could say you could say that you know on my Valentine and only our hearts and a couple of the others, he was using at least the the 21st century version of his till there was you voice. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah I, I suppose. I suppose. You know, so, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but yeah, there are you know there are several several songs where maybe yeah there may be some overuse of the you know the quote small voice. Yeah. Okay. That's it's kind of interesting how Alan thought that that kind of voice gave the album some character or or mm. supporting yeah. character. Two different points of view right there. Yeah. But right, um, right. An, another song on the album that I really like is Get Yourself Another Fool. And there yeah. you have a perfect example of Paul and his natural voice. And yes. he sounds natural singing that. But, mm-hmm. you know, Paul throughout his whole career with the Beatles on up, he's, he's always written dance hall songs. You know, When I'm 64, mm-hmm. Honey sure. Pie, those songs. Baby's Request is in that same vein, You Gave Me the Answer. Those songs. Sure. Um, so to me, for him to do songs that are meant to croon <laughs> seems pretty natural to me, even though sometimes he's he's actually made fun of that. He has parodied like Frank Sinatra every now and then. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, honey, honey like, pie, honey pie is just like sure. that. So, uh, you know, to me, it's just one of the many styles of music that Paul has explored and has done so well. Mm-hmm. So, um you know, the question is, do you like this this other voice of Paul's? And a, a good comparison, a good comparison, and it's although there are different styles, is the Russian album, where he does um, the Duke Ellington song, that everybody that he just really turned on its ear. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that was such a uh, you know, uh, it was such a great version of "Don't Get Around Much Anymore," and um, you know, I mean, he really didn't the way I thought do the same kind of there wasn't the same kind of transformation here although I I, I acknowledge that we're talking about two different you know uh, genres but mm-hmm. still if he, he if uh, I mean that uh, arrangement on don't get around much anymore was really g- a genius arrangement as far as I was concerned I really wish there had been the same kind of that with kisses on the bottom and and it's hard for me to it's hard for me to go there. It really is. But in any you, event, uh, you're talking about a rockin' version, yeah. Which no, he, no, wasn't gonna, exactly. he wasn't going to rock on "Kisses on the no, Bottom." No, I, right. I agree. I, I no, I know that. I'm, and I and I said that. I, I said we're talking about two different genres. But I, at the same time, you know, there are there are things you can do with songs in their element and he, and I don't feel he did the same thing here so mm-hmm. that's my that's my thinking I also think Tommy LaPuma has to share some of the some of the um, I don't know if you want to call it blame but uh, I mean because he was you know he was the producer on this thing so in any I event wouldn't, I wouldn't blame him no <laughs> I'm yeah. very happy that it came out and in fact there yeah. was an interview there was an interview that came out um, where Paul and Tommy are together, and Paul's yes. kind of hinting, he's hinting there may be another one. Well, I, uh, yeah, I, so I, of course, I, that's I, several I, years ago now, but right. right. And uh, I mean, but the, the album was a big success. I mean, it, it won a Grammy. So uh, let's. Say, I'm, I mean, if he can ever take time off at touring, damn it! What yeah. can I? What can I say? You know how many people but, around the world will, will crucify you for saying that? Well, yeah. See him, well, see wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Except the people in Australia, who are f- really getting upset now because he is not going there, and I, you know, I can't blame him. And I don't, and it, you know, I keep getting, I occasionally get asked questions. Why isn't he coming to Australia? I have no idea. The only thing that I really can think of is the jet lag. I mean, maybe he doesn't want to go through that anymore. Although he goes back and forth between England and the U.S. God, uh, you know, and he's, he's going to be uh, in Europe. You know, Japan is right. a long trip. Yeah, too, so. yeah that's, that's true. true. That's true, true too. I, I have no idea why he doesn't want to go back to uh, Australia. And it's, um, I'm crossing my fingers for you guys. Those of you that listen to us down there, we're, we're, I'm crossing my fingers. I hope he decides to do it. I really do. Anyway, um, do we still have some time? Well, actually, you know, I wanted to ask Alan one question. I was curious because I mentioned the fact that I went into kisses on the bottom you know from a start with a positive bias for the music because that's you know those are the songs that i grew up listening to Mm -hmm. so i gather that the that that kind of material really wasn't played in the uh the cozen household uh not particularly (laughs) when you were a kid Uh you know i don't think so i mean if my parents listened to stuff i 
generally wasn't there listening to it with them because oh, okay. I had my own thing. I mean, and I, I pretty early had you know a turntable and a stereo set up in my room, which is where I would uh-huh. go. So uh, if they were playing uh. any of that, I, I would have just probably had an attitude about it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I had to put it up with Lester Lannon and Lawrence Welk. So there, and and for uh. those, so, and and there are people who will go. Probably heard of Lawrence Welk, but probably don't know who the heck Lester yeah, Lannan is. Yeah, Lester Lannan. Uh, that would be that would be tough because that was you, have, you may have to Google Google that one. L a n i n l a n i n for those of you right. who want to Google Lester Lannan. But uh, boy, uh, yeah, oh god. And also, just like you, Al, and you, Steve, I was exposed to all this music when I was a little kid. I was mm-hmm. exposed to everything, you know, and it wasn't right. like it was force fed to me. I heard Frank Sinatra music growing up since since the womb, you know, and, sure. and Tony Bennett and Rat Pack music and, you know, all the great crooners and Bing Crosby and soundtrack music. And it's just it. So this stuff is all natural to me. And just like you, Al, I listened to the same radio station in right. New York City on the AM dial, uh-huh. which was W and E.W. And so I heard that all the time in the car. Uh, it was just natural to, for me to hear this kind of stuff. So for me, for for Paul to do this. And first of all, it's not even a stretch for Paul to do this. Just to do a whole album of it was the difference. And the yeah. fact that it's songs that were, for the most part, covered, except the two originals. So um, it was very natural for me to adapt to this. Didn't mm-hmm. take any Didn't take any effort. <laughs> nope. Nope, not at and, all. And you, know, and you know what's funny? Um, it's funny how, as you get older, you come back to that music. Even if you didn't listen to it when you were a kid, which I did not. You uh-huh. you end up finding yourself coming back to it as I as I have uh, I'm a, a big Sinatra fan a big Tony Bennett fan um, and and I've actually gotten into a lot of soundtracks over the past couple of years and that's not something that I spent a lot of time listening to when I was uh, in my teens believe me so there we go we got a couple of minutes left and I'm going to do a stump the band question for everybody and here it is. We've been talking ever since George Martin's passing. Uh, everybody's talked about how George Martin was the fifth Beatle. But here's my question. If someone, if the Beatles had expanded, and this is after 64, if the Beatles had expanded to a fifth member, who would you have added? Who would you have added? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something I've thought about. <laughs> They actually oh, did consider gosh. adding Billy Preston, but that's them. Right. You were asking us. Okay. Um, okay. Hmm. Who would you have added? Let's, and let's keep it to to say early 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 sixties rather than late because it's too easy to to say Billy Preston. Nobody did I stump you? Did I stump the band? Oh my god! It was kind would, of the, I, the perfect no, circle, you know? Yeah, exactly. I would say nobody, because I think, especially once Ringo joined, that was the final piece of the puzzle. Hmm. And so that made them the perfect unit. And I think having a fifth member would have, um, you know, it, it would have made it less perfect. Well, remember, we're talking, we're ta- number one, we're talking an imaginary situation. But still. Two, okay. All right. Yeah, it was, right. I, I, I would say, for me, nobody. Because I have an, I actually have an answer, but go ahead, go okay. ahead. Anybody, anybody else? It has to be one of their contemporaries or from uh, different... Yeah, I, I would, I, I would think it would have to be, if we're talking 60s, yeah, it would have to be a contemporary. Okay, so um, the sort of, you know, perverse imp that drives my answers much of the time um, kind of wants, <laughs> <laughs> kind of wants to say Keith Richards. Hmm, Okay. Why is Just that? Give them a, a little, you know, pull them back towards the, the, the more bluesy influences. And, um, you know, he and John could have had a great time trading Chuck Berry r- r- licks. And uh, mm. I think, uh, you know, there, there's – they obviously ultimately went in very different directions and had different interests. But I think there was enough commonality in there that that could have been interesting. Okay. Ken? Well, kind of like what Al said, I can't really see them – having a fifth member, but oh. if I had to pick one, maybe Eric Clapton. Only okay. because Eric Eric got along so well with George. They're, you know, the two of them together on guitar, 
two very different styles in a lot of ways. Um, Eric would have brought a lot more blues into the band, I think. Um, and also, you know, John loved working with Eric Clapton, too. They all admired Eric. So I think he, he certainly would have uh, gave the band even more of a presence, if that's even possible. But then also keep in mind that the Beatles weren't just about the music. The Beatles yeah. are also about the personalities, too. So if right. you're thinking about their movies, you know, could you see someone like Keith Richards or, or Eric Clapton being a fifth member and bouncing off the others personality-wise, right. too? You've got to think about that, too. It's not just about the music that they did. Right, but um, no. if I if I thought strictly music, maybe Eric Clapton or Nicky Hopkins, who was just he fits so well in with everyone that he's ever worked with, you know, um, doing the keyboard work that he did, uh, which was evident on Revolution. But um, you know, he's worked with the Stones and the Kinks and a lot of people like that. Maybe someone like that. But again, like I said, you got to think about the personalities too. Yeah, okay. and My- especially since since. You know, since Steve's, you, you said you were kind of restricting it to the early years, mm-hmm. there's no way that Eric Clapton would have joined a group like, like the Beatles because, I mean, he left the Yardbirds because right. of the fact that they had had hits <laughs> or were ha- or at least one hit. Right. Right. That's and a great going, point. And we're going to pop. So, and, uh, you know, and as far as Keith, you know, what would. What were they going to do? Steal them from the Stones? <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, this is a, like I said, this is an imaginary situation. I mean, yeah. so I mean, anything, anything is open. My answer, believe it or not, has is not uh, an instrumentalist. It's a songwriter, okay. and um, I would have said Ray Davies. Hmm. Okay. Because of oh. because of D- Davies' imagination as a songwriter, and uh, I mean. I, again, we're, we're talking an imaginary situation here, and everybody's going, "No, he would never have left the Kinks," and I know that. Uh, but I'm just yeah. saying, I'm just saying, if if you know, if you concoct the situation and you say, with the, and and you and you also know that it, although uh, I, you know we don't know for sure, you know how much power the Beatles had back then. It's very possible that they could have said come aboard and the person would have come aboard it's like a you know it's like a baseball trade or but something but when you yeah. say not a, a, a an instrumentalist i mean of, of course he was and a singer and yeah. when, so were you okay. envisioning him just joining as a composer and not playing and being like well, backstage kind of more, or? i i am I'm, I'm i'm envisioning his composing you know uh as having a lot of reason yeah. that he come he, aboard then you could get brian wilson you know yeah That's- that's true, Why don't too. you get every great songwriter in one band together? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, 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 and Brian would have been actually a, probably a better a better mix personally uh, because I I don't know I I have a feeling that having Ray Davies in the same band with with John Lennon and Paul McCartney would have been a little bit of a you know there would have been some egos uh, oh, I'm there. Sure. Uh, oh, I am I am very sure there would yeah. have been. very sure anyway oh. um we have run out of time and uh, I got to you know hold I got to hold things down before everybody goes crazy okay um <laughs> I want to thank you uh, all for listening um you can contact us by writing Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com, or we are on Twitter at Things We Said Fab. We have a, a couple of pages actually on Facebook, but we have a group page on Facebook that you're welcome to join. There's also a radio page for the Fab Four radio broadcast. And thank you, Matt, uh, and thank you, Alan, uh, on Pure Pop Radio for putting us out there. And thank you, Michael Lynch, for writing the theme song. And thank you, Alan. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Al. Thank you, me. <laughs> oh, I'm just I'm just talking away. Uh, anybody having a, have anything to say before? We- well, y- yes. As a matter of fact, uh, and Alan mentioned uh, mentioned this this afternoon. Uh, I have in my hands a copy of the brand new issue. If you can see it here, a uh, copy of the brand of the. <laughs> oh brand- yeah, I can see it. Yeah, the the brand new issue of Beetle Fan Magazine. And uh, with a picture of Sir George Martin on the cover and the lead off article in a section uh, devoted to uh, Sir George is a magnificent piece by our 
very own Mr. Cozen, and it's followed by a eh, okay piece, I'd say. No, it's a really uh, good piece, Al. <laughs> th- thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of a baker's dozen of uh, what I consider representative works of Sir George over the years, not just with the Beatles, but through throughout his career. So, right. so we want to get a get a plug in for that. All righty. Anybody else got anything to say before before I we call this an evening? Uh, you can always check out my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, for weekly Beatles trivia. And in fact, I have the brand new DVD of the first movie that Ringo starred in on his own, Candy, which is coming out uh, mm-hmm. next month. As a matter of fact, mm-hmm. so you can win that on my website. You mean as the well blue, as, uh, a Blu-ray? It's actually, oh yeah, that's right, it is the Blu-ray. It's available yeah. as both DVD and Blu-ray. Okay, because it's been out before. Uh, it's been out for m- several years. In Candy's well, case, it the... would be more like a midnight Blu-ray, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ooh. But uh, that's at uh, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And you can always email me, Ken Michaels, at everylittlething at att.net. Okay. That's it. Any any other contact uh, for you guys? Uh, you got uh, uh, Al, uh, Alan. You want to throw in some contact info? Oh, Facebook, just under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, but we also, you know, I, I read the things that come into the uh, the show email account. We got some really interesting stuff this week, so um, keep them coming. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, there was one suggestion. I won't talk about it right now, but we are we are considering it, and uh, the person who wrote it uh, will probably know what we're referring to. Um, Mr. Sussman, do you got something you want to you want to? Uh, 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 other than the brand new issue of Beetle Fan Magazine, uh, which you can get www.beetlefan.com, uh, because all the stores that used to carry it are no longer in business. Um, <laughs> For the most part. Otherwise, you can contact me on Facebook at Al Sussman or on Twitter at ASUSS49. And you can reach me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook in a couple of places. Um, I have my own page and I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary. So uh, uh, this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you very much for listening. And... See you next time.